Yeah, so we did publish this paper looking at, at really disease inherent thrombocytopenia because I think in the past we always knew that low platelets and myelofibrosis was a bad thing, right? It started to be included in these kind of not the, the older prognostic models, but certainly when you start to get into the DIPS plus, you start to look at thrombocytopenia, certainly incorporated into the more uh, novel, uh, recent, and, and, and modern uh, prognostic scoring systems. But I think I have a problem with just viewing thrombocytopenia altogether as, as, as inherently bad because I think we, we don't really know what drives thrombocytopenia. It's a little bit counterintuitive, right? This is a disease that drives through activating the thrombopoietin receptor. It should be driving overproduction of platelets. So to have low platelets means something else is going on. And so what we tried to do is really look at disease inherent thrombocytopenia to, to separate that from treatment induced thrombocytopenia, which is its own separate issue. But we looked at patients who had not received any kind of treatment, especially JAK inhibitor therapy, and who presented with thrombocytopenia less than 100,000 platelets. And we compared that to patients who had per preserved platelet counts, over 150,000, really to sharpen the comparison between intact platelet counts and lower platelet counts. And what we found is really there's a variety of, of, of genetic features of the, of the disease that actually drive the thrombocytopenia, and they're different, right? So DEL20Q, common cytogenetic abnormality, not thought to have much prognostic significance in terms of a negative prognosis associated with an increased risk of, of thrombocytopenia. Molecular co complexity, so multiple mutations. Mutations in U2AF1, Q157, and it, those are both high-risk genetic features associated with thrombocytopenia. So then the question is, okay, well then, should we be looking at various forms of thrombocytopenia differently? Are they all high risk or are they not? And I think, you know, we weren't able to see a clear trend based on the genetic future that drove it, but we wanted to look more closely at the thrombocytopenic population to see if, what are the prognostic factors in that group specifically, right? Instead of, does it correlate with what we see at large? And it was a little bit different. What we saw is three prognostic factors seem to come up as being quite important. One, the presence of a P53 mutation, which we know is inherently bad, all right? So seeing that, we know that correlates with that group of, of thrombocytopenic patient population that has already been shown to have an increased risk of leukemic progression. Then we saw the presence of an SRSF2 mutation. Okay, well, we know that that doesn't predict for thrombocytopenia, but we know it's a high-risk mutation at large. And maybe when we see that specifically in, in the low platelet, uh, low platelet group, that could predict for a disease that's going to do worse over time and have worse survival. And the last thing we saw was an albumin level. You know, serum albumin is, is obviously something that we check all the time in these patients, and it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting marker, but also a rough marker of inflammation, nutritional status. Uh, and, and, and looking at that, it seemed like that told a lot of, a lot of the story uh, of whether or not this is something that, that we should be looking at more from a prognostic significance. The reason I bring that up is we know that JAK inhibitors, especially ruxolitinib, improve serum albumin. So that goes up over time. So then if we're looking at our thrombocytopenic patients, they don't have an SRSF2 mutation, they don't have a P53 mutation, their albumin's a little bit low. Okay, well, we know that that's not necessarily a good thing, but maybe can we improve that, right? Can we change their prognosis from that standpoint? Then what about the patient who doesn't have any of those things? Sufficient albumin, no SRSF2, no P53 mutation. That might be a patient we don't consider high risk anymore just because they have low platelets, right? That might be a patient that does not need to go to transplant. And in those patients we saw their overall survival was nine, 10 years. That's not a high risk patient that needs to go to transplant necessarily. So I think it just, it was really trying to focus in on this group and maybe maybe shine a closer light to, 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 to declutter this and maybe, maybe identify or clear up some of the heterogeneity that exists with this, within this disease.